This session is the global ecological collapse happening now and the way forward. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Tom. And thank you all for being here. What I'd like to do is kind of go into some detail about the, what we're actually facing. <clears throat> Maybe it's my scientific background, but I like to lay out the evidence, the observational data to support a claim. I, I have faith in people's ability to respond. What I'd like to do is I'd like to show you this brief video. This is um, Arctic sea ice, 1979 held fixed. And next to it, you're going to see it fluctuate as a function of time. Now, if you play that out in your mind, you can ask the question, how many years do you think it will be until it's completely gone? And now, this is a really big problem. This is what's called a biofeedback. <clears throat> what that means, what's a biofeedback, it's when humanity's kind of tipped the scales to such a point where now the Earth is accelerating the problem. Because with the ice gone, ice reflects solar radiation back into space. Dark water absorbs it. And it, here's the numbers. Ice reflects about 80-85% of solar radiation back into space. That nice white ice. Water absorbs 80 to 90 percent of solar radiation. So it has like an exponential effect on warming. That's why the Arctic region is one of the areas warming the fastest. So the MIT climate study, what does that look like by way of numbers? Our best shot, and it's a very, very, very low probability of this, is a 3.5 degree Celsius warming by 2100. That equals 6 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the best case scenario, and the odds of that are less than 1 in 10 when the study was done. But I have a story to tell you that's going to make this a lot worse. Oh, <coughs> the most probabilistic scenario when the MIT climate study was done was 5.2 degrees of warming Celsius. That equals 9 degrees of Fahrenheit. That's 61, the average temperature of the planet, 61 degrees. That would go up to 70 degrees. That is a very large jump. Right now, we're well over a degree since the Industrial Revolution, and could be close to two degrees by 2030. That's probably almost definite. And the worst case scenario that the MIT climate study pointed to was a 7.4 degree warming by 2100. That would be a 13 degree increase in warming. Um, just the first one that I mentioned, the six degree Fahrenheit. I mean, that's, you know, game over for <coughs> as, like a species. <coughs> Big mammals aren't living on the planet. It might be like bacteria and rodents. But with that type of warming, our ability to grow food, like California, the Southwest, the new normal was a desert. And you see like Ferguson and the social unrest there. Let me ask you, what do you think society is going to look like when food and water is not something that's so easy, where it's so easy to go to a grocery store and get? So, you know, it's a very delicate system that we have. And that's why once we pass the We the People Amendment, then the real work begins to build local sustainable communities, have local food production, local energy production as best we can. We should have localized food production, <coughs> and energy production right away with food banks. Up until 2010, I was a perpetual optimist and thought we could pull ourselves out from this. And unfortunately, the data mounted and one of the times when I went up to Professor Chomsky's office and we looked at some of the questions I had about the MIT climate study for him, it painted a very dark picture. During that conversation, um, what we talked about was how the MIT climate study in 2009 painted a picture that said this. If at the time of the study being done, all of humanity started
stopped emitting greenhouse gas completely, then we would have a 1 in 10 chance of humans existing on the planet by 2100. If we did all that then. And then Professor Chomsky looks at me and says, but that's not what I'm most concerned about. Who here is familiar with what's going on with methane? Pause that for a second. So this ice is a meter thick. And what they're doing here is they're just putting, they're not poking a hole through the entire ice. They're just poking at the ice itself because there's bubbles of methane gas inside the ice. There's permafrost in there. There's also permafrost along the oceans. In the, low, in the shallow areas, there's also permafrost in the deep ocean. Pretty much the deep ocean permafrost goes and we're long from that. It's game over for you know everyone very quickly. But we're still a ways from that. Watch this. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to show you. So that's just poking at ice that's in Siberia. Methane plumes are just coming up each year. So now how does that add to the warming? This is what Chomsky was talking about, about the thing he was most concerned about. Because the methane, this, all this data, was not included in 2009 in the MIT oh, climate study. Oh so let's do some math real quick. So who's familiar with why 350 with regards to parts per million of carbon is like a very important number? 350 parts per million, that's when we reach what's called a tipping point. Okay? Yeah. And for about the last million years, we've never been over 300 pots per million. So back in 2007, it was uh, 387 pots per million when I did my analysis. In 2013 May, it reached 400 pots per million. Okay, so now. That's 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide, okay? So methane is right around two parts per million, okay? That seems relatively benign. It's like, what is that gonna do, okay? But the thing with methane is it has a heat retention index 23 times that of carbon. What does that mean? Two parts per million of methane is equal to 46 parts per million of carbon dioxide. This is of methane. This is approximately 46 parts per million CO2. So just the land permafrost is projected to increase the parts per million by a factor of 10. So that's excuse me, 20 parts per million of methane, which is approximately 460 parts per million of CO2. So now when Professor Chomsky looked at me and said, that's not what most concerns me, I looked at him and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, my goodness. Because you can see that this is more than going to double the problem, and remember the odds without this it factored in. So, the number of, in parts per million of carbon dioxide, that is the scientific agreed upon point of no return, is 450 parts per million. 450 parts per million of just carbon dioxide is the point at which Earth systems will continue to exacerbate the problem regardless of what we do to pretty much shut down life in the sixth great extinction. And that's called the Anthropocene, because humans are driving it. You know, what we can do to face this. We talk, I talked about the We the People Amendment as our offense. How many people have ever heard of an Article 5 convention? There have been now a few states that have called for it, California, um, Vermont, uh, Illinois, and uh, New Jersey. So Massachusetts has legislation right now and it's to be the next state calling for an Article 5 convention by the people. <laughs> you need 34 states to call for an Article 5 convention before it happens. 
the safety valve is that 38 states have to ratify it. Okay, so if you've got something that was completely wild and radical, that's like, you know, undoes, you know, the rights and that we all believe in, it's not going to get passed by 38 states. The only thing that has a broad base of support is this issue, the We the People Amendment saying corporations do not have constitutional rights and money is not speech. Now let me try to connect that with this dire kind of picture that I've laid out of all this the environment. <laughs> so there I, am, there I am with Professor Chomsky and he says this to me and it's like, okay, so what you're essentially saying is you laid out that picture of 10% chance if we do all this, but methane's doubling the problem, oh my gosh, and we have this 10 to 15 year window. What's the window? As I said, the window, that's our period of time that we have to wrestle the power away from concentrations of private wealth. That's what we have right now. Because once things get so bad that there's food and water shortages at mass, what do you think is going to happen? What can you imagine in Homeland Security, World of the Patriot Act, you know, FEMA world? What is, uh, what is society going to look like? Might look a little bit like Ferguson, Missouri, right? Well, they'll be, you know, they'll use militarized, you know, um, vehicles and stuff. I mean, look, there's no surprise right now what's going on. You know, the Pentagon's given, what are they, I, 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 the town I, that I live in just got a tank. Right. Because when, when there's social unrest, there will be ways to control people. So we have this window of time to wrestle the power away from the ruling elite. And at this climate science, that's what's going to drive it. Because when this instability because of food and water, well, that's what's going to cause the instability. This year we're doing this birthday thing. It's a trial run for the month of May. Next year we're going to do a summer of action from Earth Day to Constitution Day. This thing called corporate personhood, what is that? So everyone knows what it is. And that they know corporate constitutional rights didn't start with the Citizens United ruling and that overturning Citizens United is not enough. That we need to pass the We the People Amendment to confront this. So we're going to be doing a summer of action from, from May 1st to September 16th. September 17th is the five-year anniversary, anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. Right? Yeah. Right? So, what, so seven weeks of encampments, hoping for, and this time we would really like to organize, and you're welcome to try to help plan this in your communities with like Unitarian churches who signed on to the amendment process. But strategically, the first critical step is the passage of the We the People Amendment, that everyone gets on board with that. After we pass the We the People Amendment, I cannot impress upon people enough that that's when the work really begins to build local sustainable communities. And we really need to think critically of doing that. Food storage. Okay? Local food production, aquaponics, the big thing, algae as a tool, whatever could possibly be used locally. And honestly, if you tried doing that now, if you ever got big enough, it would get squashed. Because that's what they do. They don't let these initiatives really take fire. You can't roll out solutions. Remember I said about the Congressional Report, 17.4 million real jobs and sustainability? I mean, we really could address this situation, and we need to with the vigor that we did to the Manhattan Project. I would be remiss if I did not say this. When we pass the We the People Amendment, it is time for us to learn how to be stewards of the land from those we took it from. And at that point, you know, that's when we can really build local sustainable communities that are people-centered. Thank you so much for your time. I'll be around for any questions. Thank you.